Hello and welcome to this edition of In Focus, brought to you by the Uongozi Institute. I'm your host, Gwamaka Kifukwe, here from the African Leadership Forum in Kigali, Rwanda. On this edition of the program, we'll be discussing with Dr. Donald Kabaruka the implications of changes in the global financing architecture and what that means for the financing of Africa's transformation for sustainable development. Dr. Kabaruka, welcome to the program. Pleasure. So I'd like to start out, could you give us a sense of what's going on globally in terms of the developing financing architecture? In uh, 2015, there was uh, a global gathering in Addis Ababa called Financing for Development. So that was coming on top of uh, agreement on uh, sustainable development goals. And the uh, image behind that was what would it take to attain to finance the sustainable development goals? And the conclusion was that um, the architecture we've had since 1945 uh, was not fit for the challenge of today. And that we have to look at a different uh, paradigm, so to speak. Now, the architecture developed in 1995 makes uh, three important assumptions. 1945, this is when uh, the World Bank was created, International Monetary Fund, uh, got the precursor to WTO, and where the, the whole system, vehicles of how resources are channeled for development um, are deployed. So, three important assumptions. Number one, that resources were mainly in the northern hemisphere. And therefore, the transfer of resources was a north-south direction. Uh, we now know that uh, uh, the direction of resources is multipolar. In the north, in the south, in the west, in the east. So an important consideration. A second assumption made in 1945 was that money or resources were largely in the public sector domain within the control of governments. And so it was an architecture of government to government. We now know that uh, actually the level of resources available in the private markets is a huge multiple of what the government can deploy. Uh, to give an example, uh, if you securitize the remittances alone globally, that would be a multiple of the capital of the World Bank. So uh, money is no longer a north-south affair. It's no longer a public sector affair largely. It is more a private sector uh, affair. Third assumption was that the deployment of resources will go along with a policy package to make sure that the money gets results. And that, uh, that the policy package was around the neoliberal uh, approach. Neoliberal meaning uh, the free markets, a market will deliver the goods, the state should be largely a night watchman, that kind of stuff. Kind of Washington consensus. Well, if you want, if you want. So we, we find now an institution whereby we need to develop a new paradigm because of the sustainable development goals. And to conclude, so where we are today. No sooner had we signed the sustainable development goals, we have now a, the world's most important economic power questioning the fundamentals of the agreements of 2015. Uh, they have walked out of the climate deal agreed in Paris, questioning the basis of um, rule-based trade arrangements, uh, WTO, uh, questioning the essence of multilateral uh, action, and uh, what is left of funding in the classic sense is now linked to migration and to a lesser extent uh, to security and counterterrorism. So that is to say, uh, resource flow is an, seen to be an answer to 
dealing with migration, which migration is causing populism in rich countries, or is seen as a way of dealing with issues around uh, terror and counterterrorism. And so we're in a completely different place from the big hopes of 2015. And in, for, for us who are in developing countries, how much of a voice do we have when it comes to now discussions about financing for transformation, for development? You know, as you mentioned, these were largely northern powers that got together and set up these institutions. As we're now talking about evolving them or starting new ones or changing the, the architecture, what, what position do we developing countries come from? What, what can we really do to influence that kind of discussion, that consensus building? When time came for African countries to, to get their independence, they didn't ask for it as a favor from anyone. The people of that generation who are your age then, uh, some countries they took up arms, in other countries they organized. Uh, as someone say, you don't agonize, you organize. So time has come for the African countries to take cognizance of the fact that the current multilateral structure is not consistent with the ambitions and understand that the solution is here. And the first solution is an agreement that we need to treat the recently signed continental free trade area as the biggest door to those possibilities. It does not resolve everything. Tariffs are only part of the problem. But tariffs will lead to greater opening, free movement of people, non-tariff restrictions, and that will increase the size and the diversity of the markets. It will attract more investment to the continent. It will create jobs. It will enable us to move up the global value chains. It will enable transformation, uh, understood by you and I as economic growth, which is uh, greater than population increase, uh, moving up the global value chains, moving to complex products, and lifting all the boats uh, as we uh, stick into uh, global capital and global trade. It is something we have to fight for and own. And for me, uh, investing all the time it takes in this new agreement on, uh, on uh, economic integration of the continent is fundamental. And with that, what is the second issue? You have heard it often uh, said that uh, by 2030, the demographics of this continent will be uh, a game changer. But only if we invest in the people. Only if we invest in the talents of the people. There's too much attention given to natural resources, things we have inherited from God, which are finite. I would hope that an equal amount, if not a greater attention is given to actually investing in that resource which is long-lasting, which is transformational, which the young people. That is the only way our demographics would become a dividend. And just to stay just on this kind of track of, uh, of funding specifically, um, there has been a growing kind of discourse around ending aid as aid, whether we consider that charity or whatever. Um, from where you sit, is this a negative discourse? Is this something you view as, as positive? Do you welcome it? And you know, what, what opportunities does that present? But also, what challenges does the end of aid present? Well, two things. First of all, every aid program has to end at some point. So the issue is when, but it has to end. If it does not end, it has failed. So whether I welcome it or not, if a program of aid does not end, it has no exit point. It has failed. Second, I think we should not overestimate the role of aid today. Role for humanitarian purposes, for emergencies, for fragile states, uh, for conflict affected countries remains very important. But for steady state uh, countries, the share of aid in total resource uh, deployment has declined significantly over the last uh, 15 years. I would put it ballpark, if you want, uh, 
of close to what, 700, 800 billion dollars deployed in Africa for development. That uh, aid, as defined by the OECD, is only 40 billion. 40 out of 800 billion. So it is still an important component of budgets of some countries who are in conflicts, who are in difficulties. But steady state countries, uh, the share of aid has uh, declined dramatically. And finally, you have to question yourself, why should uh, a government mobilize money from its taxpayers to give you? What is, why is it for? It could be for moral reasons, they want help. It could be for altruistic reasons, it helps you and I. Or it could be geostrategic. All right? I would like to have more countries resembling mine in terms of uh, uh, the way the state is, the way it composes, the way it behaves, and so on. So there was an ideological uh, uh, reason for it. And today, when you look at countries uh, in the top league, the top 20 countries in the world, they've reached where they are by different directions, not necessarily through the aid channel. They have all got there largely because of the abilities to tap into trade and capital. And for Africa, it cannot be different. And as you mentioned, there's this kind of multipolarity of where financing is available from. And of course, each one comes with its own conditions and terms and, and everything else. We've seen, as you mentioned, more money now invested in the private sector. You've seen the rise of philanthropists. Uh, there's been calls for increased domestic resource mobilization. When it comes now to financing our transformation on the continent, what, what approaches can we take to tap into these? and make sure that they're effective for what we want to do. Again, referring both to what's happening globally, but specifically within the continent itself. One thing the world is not short of today is, uh, is funding. You know, today, the, because of the quantitative easing and um, uh, the effects of the global financial crisis, today the return on those kind of uh, money is 0.7%, if you like, below 1%. So all investors all over the world are looking of where to get a good return. And why is that a good return? Where the risk adjusted. That return is in Africa and parts of Asia. So the question to ask is, what does it take for us to attract that capital? And second, what are the vehicles that we need to de-risk uh, some of the perceived risk? And I want to put it to you that the very first thing that we're looking for is a market of considerable depth and considerable size, considerable complexity. Not one of the tiny markets of the 54. So that is the first thing you have to do. Having done that, there are things to invest in, obviously. <laughs> uh, stability. Money does not go to unstable areas. Second, reasonable infrastructure. They don't expect to have first-class Canada-type infrastructure. But there should be basics to run an economy. Uh, and I do think that on that one, we're making good progress. But the most important one is this one of expanding our market, both in depth and diversity. Let me take a, a, maybe a different tack, coming again to this question of, of, of the possibility of a global financing architecture. Is it possible to, to do something like that in, this, in our context now? Or should we not be discussing a global financing architecture and just realize that there are these different modalities and we need to adjust to the one that we want to tap into. Um, and I ask this because if we agree that we had things like the Bretton Woods institutions and so on, we can either say that we need to change the international con consensus right, and make this a global commons, as you will. You know, development for everyone is a good thing for everyone and therefore there should be some kind of solidarity. Or do we take it as a different approach and say, well, you as a country or you as a region are responsible for your development. And therefore, you should adjust to the type of financing which we accept is available that works for you. Mm. So um, let me answer that this way. Uh, the world is getting so small. Uh, we're so interconnected. 
whether it is the economy, migration, terrorism, epidemics. We need a multilateral system that functions. And we are absolutely in our right to want to demand a reformed international architecture where all of us have a role and a voice. So we can't simply stop the train and walk off. We are part of the train. As a former Italian Prime Minister once said, uh, if you're on the Titanic, some people will be sitting in the first class compartment, others in the business compound, others in the coach class. But if we don't fight to keep the Titanic running, it doesn't matter where you're sitting, does it? So that is not multilateralism. Second thing, um, you have today many speakers uh, recounting how much resources are available on this continent, even beginning with the resources available in our long-term institutional investors, pension funds, uh, sovereign wealth funds, aspects of the central bank reserves and so on. All this is invested in the West, where they're getting 0.7%. Now, they are doing so not because they are unreasonable. Uh, they are looking for security for uh, those resources. They are looking for liquidity. Like they are looking for a good return. And, uh, you know, those kind of things. And uh, one thing we have been trying to do is to say, can we create an African institutional vehicle which maybe have a triple A, double A, or single A rating? which provide those same answers which institutional investors are looking for. So we can get African resources mobilized for things like infrastructure. So two years before I left the African Development Bank, we created such a special purpose vehicle, mainly to be able to mobilize uh, the savings within Africa itself, deploy them some of these asset classes which provide a liquidity, good risk, and, uh, and a good return. Uh, we need more of those kind of institutions. And Africa has to take it on itself to create those kind of vehicles and those kind of institutions, mobilizing person of all resources within the continent. And, and just to kind of follow that train of thought, what will it take? What are the key things that we then need to work on to, to get there? I mean, we accept it's a very diverse continent, but there surely are certain principles that cut across that everyone can start to apply in order to move in that general direction. So as we began this uh, vehicle, I walked around, I mean, I went around different capitals, tried to convince uh, heads of states and ministers of the importance of this vehicle of African infrastructure. Some agreed and they uh, invested in this uh, institution, Africa 50. So African Development Bank is an investor, governments are investors, uh, institutional investors and so on. Others had different questions. Others had different priorities. Others had an attitude of, well, at least how it works, and then we come along. I think it is that attitude of, uh, we have time on our side. It is that attitude of, uh, well, my country first, no sense of agency. Same for the continental free trade area. There's no reason why we should not be having already the 22 uh, ratifications. We should be having them, or close to having them. But again, if every country proceeds on, on this as a single, uh, you know, a zero-sum calculus, uh, then it will take us a long, long time. So it's similar to the challenges that we see in things like just general integration, where some states are all for it and others are saying, well, maybe not, I can do this alone, I don't want to share with my neighbor or my colleague a bit further afield. Integration all over the world is not easy. Uh, look at the European experience. So it requires a lot of work. I suppose what I'm saying is that we don't have the luxury when you look at the counterfactual, uh, because the counterfactual is very costly for the prosperity of this continent. So I think it behoves on all of us, uh, leaders in governments, business, young people, uh, to come together and identify those particular growth drivers and bottlenecks to it, which we need together to mobilize to ensure that uh, we can get enough resources, human, financial, and otherwise,
for transformation of Africa. And just to, to kind of wrap up the interview, we'd like to invite the guests to give a kind of parting shot or a key message. Uh, when it comes to this question of the global finance architecture, what would you want the audience to really take away from, from, from your thoughts and what we've been discussing here? You know, what, what should they come away from this interview saying, that's something I really need to, to take on board in my decision making, in my policy design, in my leadership? I said so this morning, uh, development, transformation is more than money. You need lots of money, but it's more than money. I've said uh, this morning that if money was the solution to transformation, Libya would have been the most transformed country in the world. A small population, huge amount of resources before the heavy crisis. But I used to travel a lot to that country and uh, I look at the educational system, uh, the financial system, the health system, uh, clearly they were a long, long way despite having huge amounts of money. So it's about money, yes. But transformation does not come by money alone. It has to be accompanied by policies. It has to be accompanied by ability to execute your vision. It has to be accompanied by a national project which is shared by all the citizens. And so I do think as we look around this uh, issue of funding transformation, it should not be simply where are the dollars. It should be where are the things I need to transform my national project, my vision into the future for the country. It requires dollars, it requires also policies, it requires a bit to execute, a sense of agency. Uh, and for me, the idea that somehow Africa is poor, short of resources, and cannot transform until the rest of the world says so, is something which the future generations uh, should not accept. Well, on that note, thank you very much for joining us on the program, and welcome again soon.